Welcome, dear listeners, to another disturbing tale. The year was 1867, and in the heart of the Derwent Valley, nestled amidst the sprawling hills of Consit, there lived an old man named Archibald Blackwood. A figure of disdain and loathing, his reputation was one of wickedness and selfishness, unlike any other. Stories of his malevolent deeds echoed through the valley, from swindling poor farmers out of their land, exploiting the labour of the townspeople for his own gain, to maliciously spreading rumours that led to the downfall of innocent families. Archibald's appearance was as grand as his reputation was sinister. He adorned himself with finely tailored suits made from the most expensive fabrics, and his pocket watch, a symbol of his wealth, was made of pure gold and encrusted with diamonds. Yet, despite his opulent appearance, he was known for his tight-fistedness, often seen haggling with local merchants over the most trivial amounts of money. One particular incident that contributed to Archibald's wicked reputation involved the Dawson family, who lived on a small farm adjacent to his estate. The Dawsons were known for their kindness and generosity, often sharing their modest harvest with their neighbours during tough times. Archibald, coveting their land for its fertile soil, concocted a malicious plan to drive them out. He spread a rumour that the Dawsons were afflicted with a contagious disease, causing the townspeople to shun them. Desperate and isolated, the Dawsons were forced to sell their land to Archibald at a fraction of its worth. It was Tuesday the 12th of November. Archibald had been busily plotting yet another dastardly scheme. He was hunched over a desk littered with maps and legal documents, planning to divert the river that ran through the town in order to monopolise the water supply for his own estate. With a wicked grin, he envisioned the townspeople begging him for water as their crops withered and died. Archibald, always one to derive pleasure from others' misery, chuckled to himself at the thought. However, as he raised a glass of wine to toast to his own cunning, a sudden wave of dizziness washed over him. Confused and disoriented, he felt his heart racing and his vision narrowing. Archibald, never one to indulge in superstitions, dismissed the sensation as a momentary lapse and took another sip of his wine. Almost instantly, a searing pain shot through his chest, causing him to gasp for air. Clutching his chest, Archibald's mind raced as he tried to comprehend what was happening. As the pain intensified, he felt a crushing weight on his chest, as if an elephant was standing on him. With a final gasp, he slumped over his desk, the glass of wine shattering on the floor. Unbeknownst to Archibald, the wine he had been drinking was laced with a potent poison, a gift from a rival he had crossed one too many times. The poison, known as the Reaper's Embrace, was notorious for inducing a catatonic state that mimicked death, only to revive its victim hours later, leaving them fully aware but paralysed. It was a fitting end for a man as wicked as Archibald, or so his rival thought. The local doctor, after a brief examination, declared Archibald to be in a catatonic state, likely induced by the immense stress of his many nefarious dealings. With no close family or friends to speak of, the townspeople hastily prepared for his burial, eager to rid themselves of the evil presence that had plagued their lives for so long. The funeral director, a man well acquainted with Archibald's miserable ways, opted for a cheap pine coffin despite the old man's considerable wealth. Inside the coffin, along with Archibald's finely dressed body, a candle and a box of matches were placed, a customary practice for those who feared being buried alive. Additionally, a cord was tied to Archibald's wrist, attached to a bell above ground, a precaution that seemed almost humorous given the circumstances. As the rain began to pour, a small group of townspeople gathered at the cemetery to witness the burial of the man they all so deeply despised. The rain quickly turned into a torrential downpour, drenching the mourners and turning the ground into a muddy quagmire. As the coffin was lowered into the ground, water began to seep into the cracks, slowly dripping onto Archibald's forehead. Inside the coffin, the cold droplets of water roused Archibald from his catatonic state. Confusion quickly turned to panic as he realised the dire situation he was in. Frantically, he struck a match and lit the candle, the flickering light illuminating the inside of the coffin. The realisation that he was buried alive, coupled with the claustrophobic darkness of the coffin, sent Archibald into a state of sheer terror. Desperately, he tried to keep the candle lit as the rainwater continued to trickle in, 
each drop extinguishing the flame as quickly as he could relight it. As the reality of his predicament sank in, Archibald's mind raced with thoughts of escape. He knew that the bell above ground was his only hope of being rescued, but with the rain pouring down and the ground saturated with water, he feared that the cord would not hold. With trembling hands, he grasped the cord and began to pull, praying that someone would hear the bell and come to his aid. As the rain continued to pour outside, Archibald, now fully aware of his dreadful situation, started to panic. The water seeping into the coffin was making it increasingly difficult to keep the candle lit. Desperate and terrified, he decided to ring the bell, hoping that someone would hear it and come to his rescue. With a sense of urgency, he pulled the cord attached to his wrist, causing the bell above ground to ring frantically. The sound of the bell, combined with the howling wind and pouring rain, created an eerie symphony that echoed through the night. The cemetery caretaker, a grizzled old man named Edgar, was sitting in his small cottage at the edge of the cemetery when he thought he heard the faint sound of a bell ringing. Straining his ears, he listened carefully, dismissing it at first as a figment of his imagination. But as the ringing continued, he realized that it was indeed coming from the cemetery. Alarmed, he grabbed his lantern and ventured out into the stormy night. As Edgar made his way through the cemetery, the wind howling and the rain pelting down, he struggled to pinpoint the source of the ringing. The bell, swaying in the wind, created an erratic sound that seemed to come from all directions. Just as Edgar thought he had honed in on the location, the bell cord, weakened by the rain and the frantic pulling, suddenly snapped, causing the ringing to stop abruptly. Inside the coffin, Archibald felt a wave of despair wash over him as the cord went limp in his hand. No, no, no! He screamed in desperation, his voice muffled by the confines of the coffin. Realizing that his only hope of rescue had just been severed, he started to shout for help, hoping that someone would hear him over the storm. Help! For God's sake, someone help me! He cried, pounding on the lid of the coffin with his fists. His voice was hoarse, and his throat ached from the effort, but he continued to shout driven by a primal instinct to survive. In a moment of utter desperation, he began to plead with God. Please, God! I know I have been a wicked man, but I beg you, save me from this wretched fate! He sobbed, tears mixing with the rainwater that trickled down his face. As the words left his lips, he was startled by a sound that chilled him to the bone, a sinister, mocking laughter that seemed to come from the very depths of the earth. Is that you, devil? he whispered, trembling with fear. Have you come to claim my soul? The laughter grew louder, filling the coffin with its malevolent sound, and Archibald felt the last vestiges of hope slip away. It was 2 a.m. in the morning when a group of grave robbers, aware of Archibald's recent demise and hoping to steal his valuables, made their way to the cemetery. Armed with shovels and lanterns, they began to dig up Archibald's grave, this old bastard must have some nice stuff on him, eh? One of them said, grinning at his companions. I've heard he's got a gold pocket watch worth a fortune, another added. Let's chop off his head and take his fancy clothes and jewellery. Leave him with nothing but his birthday suit, the third one chuckled sinisterly. Inside the coffin, Archibald heard the sound of shovels hitting the ground above him. Elated, he started to shout even louder, hoping to catch the attention of the grave robbers. Yes! Yes! Dig me out! I'm alive! He screamed, banging on the lid of the coffin. Despite the pouring rain and howling wind, the robbers continued to dig, oblivious to the muffled cries for help coming from below. Just as they reached the top of the coffin, Edgar, having spotted their lanterns from a distance, fired a warning shot into the air. Startled, the robbers dropped their shovels and fled into the night, leaving the hole they had dug partially filled with rainwater. Cowardly bastards, Edgar muttered to himself as he began to fill the hole back in. Unaware of Archibald's desperate cries for help, he hastily sealed the old man's fate. As the dirt and mud covered the coffin once again, Archibald felt a sense of hopelessness that he had never experienced before. No, no, don't bury me again, I'm alive, he wailed. But his cries fell on deaf ears as the heavy thuds of soil landing on the coffin drowned out his voice. For the next 13 hours, Archibald experienced the most harrowing hours of his life. 
The coffin became a living nightmare, a claustrophobic prison that intensified with each passing second. Confined in the pitch darkness, the only sounds he could hear were the occasional drip of water from the coffin lid and his own labored breathing. As the oxygen level inside the coffin decreased, his mind began to play tricks on him. He started to hear faint whispers in the darkness, as if the spirits of the deceased were taunting him for his wickedness. Each time he closed his eyes, he saw twisted faces, distorted by hate and vengeance, sneering at him. The walls of the coffin seemed to close in on him, and he could feel the weight of the earth above crushing him. It was as if the very ground he had walked on his entire life was exacting its revenge. As the pitch-black darkness consumed him, Archibald remembered the matches and the candle that he had previously used. Fumbling in the dark, his trembling hands finally found them. Striking a match, he lit the candle, its feeble glow illuminating the small space. For a moment, he felt a flicker of hope. But the dampness inside the coffin and the dwindling supply of oxygen made it difficult to keep the candle lit. Come on, stay lit, stay lit, he muttered to himself, desperately trying to shield the flame from the damp air with his hand, but to no avail. Harold, Archibald's only living relative, arrived at the grave at 3 p.m., completely oblivious to the ordeal his brother was enduring beneath the ground. The two had always had a strained relationship, due to Archibald's deceitful and manipulative nature. Archibald had swindled Harold out of his share of their inheritance, leaving him destitute while Archibald lived a life of luxury. You took everything from me, Archibald, Harold murmured, a mixture of anger and sadness in his voice. You lied, cheated and stole from your own flesh and blood. Was it worth it? As he poured a bottle of rum over the grave, a gesture of farewell, he added, I hope you find the peace in death that you never found in life. As Harold turned and walked away, the weight of the mud and rain from the previous night caused the coffin lid to collapse, burying Archibald in a torrent of mud. Panicking, Archibald continued his futile struggle with the candle, gasping for air as the mud filled the coffin. Please, please, I don't want to die like this, he whispered, choking on the mud. His brother, thinking he had heard a voice, turned to the grave once again, but quickly dismissed the idea and continued walking. In his final moments, as the mud filled his mouth and nostrils, Archibald heard the dark laughter once again, as if anticipating his demise. Despite everything, the flickering candle had provided a glimmer of hope in his darkest hour. As he took his last breath, the candle went out for the last time, plunging Archibald into eternal darkness. So, dear listeners, now that you know of the dark take of Archibald, let it serve as a stark reminder of the weight our actions carry, both in life and beyond. The suffocating darkness that engulfed him is a physical manifestation of the solitude his actions wrought in life. Our choices, good or bad, will always come back to haunt us in one way or another. Remember, as you listen, that the darkness is never too far away, and redemption is always just out of reach. Prepare yourself for a journey into the deepest recesses of the human soul and take heed of the warning that lies within. We may not always get a second chance, 